How are you, Jack? How are you? I am very good. How are you, sir? How's things? Welcome up to County Mead. That's where we're recording here today. In his lovely abode. Uh -huh. Thanks Thanks for having me. Delighted, delighted. So we've spent the last five minutes trying to figure out how we were going to start this in a seamless way. Right? Trying to get a good opening. So we might as well just get stuck into it. Absolutely. You have a pretty inspiring story. Thank you. Um, I think we were chatting about this earlier, but um, it's really, it's when you when you look at other people's stories, it's it's your perception that you look at them through that it's either inspiring or not. You find something in, in them that's inspiring. So thanks very much. It's one person's normal is another person's crazy. Like there you go. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I heard where I met to, where I met Jack was up in uh, up in a seminar. He gave a talk, um, and it was it was. He had a really, really good kind of mindset talk. Um, and I was just like, geez, I'd love to sit down with this man and just kind of talk to him for a bit. Do you want to just start by uh, telling your story a little bit? Yeah. So um, I suppose you need to start at the beginning to, to really get a context of it. But I grew up like most young lads. I was a little bit crazy up at the start of the day and tearing around the place. I was involved in all kinds of sports, everything I'd get my hands on. Um, all the usual scale of hurling. I played a lot of rugby, did a lot of running, and then during the summers it was water sports and things like that. Um, but was really written off as a problem child growing up by my school. Um, and uh, I know what that's like. <laughs> constantly causing causing trouble and phone calls home See, and all of this. We were too, I was just that we are twins, so you, even if you were just half as bold, the other book was half as bold, it's just counted as... Double trouble. Yeah, they'd always just say there's a pair of you in it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, somehow I was enough just by myself to, to cause a havoc. And, um, you were twins up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it turned out uh, that I was badly dyslexic and my energies were just being misdirected. And so as I went through primary school, then I started to get a bit of assistance and extra help. And, I learned how to apply myself and that really carried through as I went into secondary school then and then um, I actually became quite a diligent guy. Oh, it just um, was it hard to concentrate stuff, is it? Really hard initially, like I, I wasn't taking anything in and I couldn't concentrate or focus on, on what everyone was doing, I didn't understand it and I would have been trying to hide that, uh, I suppose, when I was younger. You were like, written off as the bold child then kind of mean that. Yeah, I didn't want to come across as stupid or that uh, I hated when we would do our spelling test. Like, it seemed like it was happening every day. Um, but yeah, as I came into secondary school then, things really changed for me because I'd gotten a lot of help and I was able to apply myself then. So going through secondary school, as I said, I became quite diligent and that balance between work and play became really important to me. So I, I played a lot of sports during secondary school and I was really into rugby and um, running and I, I went to a boarding school. So it was great after school, we'd head straight out on the pitches and um, you'd either be training with the team or on the days that we had off, uh, I'd head off running by myself. and. Those two things, it's only looking back, you realize how important they both were. Because when you're training, whatever type of a team you're training with, no, and no matter what level it's at, you're learning all the skills of interacting with others and yeah. being a team player. Competitive as well is, is yeah. a um, big thing. And the idea of like collectively having an ambition to do something um, yeah. was nice. Um, but then I loved running as well. And I used to run by myself a lot, and that was just nice sort of training to learn to be alone, uh, both physically and with your thoughts. Um, and then during those years, like everyone, I was questioning everything. I was questioning my body image and I was questioning my spirituality in a very Catholic school. I was pushing back against that. And um, really at times I was bullied and there was times when it was me that was acting as the bully and all of this. Um, that we all go through as a teenager and yeah. started to form a bit of a sense of myself as I went into college and I can remember being down the west of Ireland and at the end of first year in college so I used yeah. to 
County Mayo, <laughs> where you're from. Uh, a little bit past where you're from. Out in, no, you were out in the sticks, all right. Out in Off the, the grid. Yeah, I don't think they even have air codes out there. <laughs> and, it's uh, just one big air code. Out there. Yeah. So I used to spend uh, my summers out in Belmullet, um, because my real passion was windsurfing. And I used to work as an instructor out there in an Irish college called Clash Lishka. And um, one of the first night or evenings down there, I cycled off to the beach. And it's really one of those scenes that fetched into my memory. And um, I can remember looking back down the beach and uh, the only footprints on the beach are my own. And I'm looking out over the water and the waves are breaking and the sun is setting. It's just gorgeous. It's a beautiful part of the world. It really is. And I find myself sitting there and next thing I catch myself smiling. And that was sort of... Smirking, you might say. Smirking. I found my smirk. (laughs) Um, And I just caught myself um, at that time. And I realised that I was just, for the first time, I was comfortable with who I was. Um, The work that I'd put in, uh, that it had led me to where I was at that time. Doing a course that I was enjoying. I was loving the people that I was getting to hang out with. And I sort of found my people... Um, and the Mayo folk, isn't it? The Mayo folk, <laughs> the Wild West. And um, I was just in a really happy place. And it was my first time really appreciating that. And then a couple of weeks later, my whole life turned upside down. And so it was the end of that summer. I went away on a holiday to Portugal with some of my mates from school. And it was on the first day. As I'd done so many times that day and through the summer working as a lifeguard um, I ran down the beach dived in over a wave and I didn't realize that there was a sandbank behind the wave and the water was incredibly shallow so when I hit the bottom I hit my head and I broke my neck and um, yeah so that was a big moment um, curveball curveball dramatically just when just at that time in my life when I was really at a place of comfort for the first time life said no no you won't no, stay there for too long it's not going to be that easy um, so that happened in Portugal so I spent some time um, in intensive care and the way I describe it is that really luckily I was taken from the water before I drowned were you were you awake on yeah, so I was fully conscious uh, in the water, and it's weird, like, you hear it on TV and you see it on TV, that these moments where your life sort of flashes in front of your eyes, well, I had that moment, and it's sort of just an awareness of of the things that are important to you, and, like, I saw, I saw a lot of my friends, I saw my family, I saw my girlfriend at the time, and just flashing in front of my eyes, and you're you get a, a pretty quick awareness of the things that matter to you when when you have that feeling that it could all be taken away yeah um but luckily the lads on the beach noticed that i wasn't messing around and they took me from the water and it was kind of chaos on the beach with some of them running to get help from lifeguards uh some of the lads running off to see if they could get medical details of any kind and then lads being lads like there was a crowd of people gathering on a beach in portugal and they were just lying on the ground beside me talking about the talent like it was <laughs> it was just this normality so if you ever want to get attention on the beach just get one of the mates to lie down <laughs> do you know so it was like this weird contrast of things happening yeah a very um, serious situation but... but then trying to make light of it and yeah. keep things normal for me um, and what were you saying you were just i can't move with it or yeah well I think it's kind of funny in that I was probably the only one out of the group to have the training to deal with that. And I was the one that found myself in the situation that I needed to help. Um, so I pretty much knew what had happened. Yeah. Uh, I told Connor, my friend on the beach, I said, look, I think I've broken my neck. Um, let's not move me, if at all possible. Um, the likelihood is is that like this strong possibility that I'm gonna be paralyzed, um, oh, and I had that awareness on the beach, and then the paramedics come and they load me up into the ambulance and I was taken away, 
got to a helipad and I was flown off and I woke up a couple of days later in intensive care um, and I gradually become aware of all the tubes in my throat and I can remember there's a light above me and uh, I can remember counting the eight screws in the light fitting holding it in and then I remember becoming aware that I had a metal cage around my head keeping my neck and, and, and head still and all of these things sort of happened and then over the next little while my friend Gareth walked around the bottom of my bed and I have, have this memory of being greeted by this smiling but tear-filled face and me trying to mouth, mouth the words, it's going to be okay. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't talk though? No? I couldn't speak because I was on a ventilator so I couldn't oh. breathe for myself. So I had all these tubes down my mouth and I, I couldn't speak for a couple of weeks. Um, like a good couple of weeks, maybe six weeks after the injury. Good, yeah. Um, so we had a, we had this way where my friends would be or my family would be on either side of the bed and it was nearly like predicted text. Um, they'd be guessing what I was trying to mouth out. and Breathe. Yeah, fairly quickly, after a couple of uh, very frustrating days for me, they realised that the Portuguese alphabet, that they'd given us this board that I could, oh, that I they see. could point to. Portuguese alphabet doesn't have some of the some oh, of the no? letters that we would use. <laughs> so you have to be careful what words you were saying. Um, but really, over the next couple of months, I was flown back from Portugal and I went to intensive care in Ireland, and then on to the rehab. And it was really then that I started to reckon with what had happened for the first time. Like, um, you go from this position where you're a free, independent young guy to a scenario where I literally. I couldn't pull my hand up to scratch my nose and um, the scenario was that I was starting from scratch. I was like a baby again and my first job was to learn to breathe it without the aid of a, of a machine and then I had to go and learn everything from scratch. So I have 15% muscle function, so my, my shoulders, my biceps and my wrists. I don't have any hand function and I'm paralyzed from the, the armpits down. So, you could say that I was thrown in at the deep end of, of being put in a vulnerable situation and really having to reckon with myself. Yeah. And I, I went back and I had to ask myself all those questions that I'd answered as a teenager about my body image and about my sense of myself and how I fit in in the world. And, yeah. Um, all of these kind of things and probably the hardest and it's a lot harder than it must have been the first time around there. yeah well I think this time I knew that my choices mattered um, because I had a real awareness that that this was an event that happened and the only thing that was going to matter going forward was, was how I responded to the event um so at that time i can remember years later my dad told me that on the flight over and um, understandably my mum kept asking why jack like why would this happen to jack and dad responded and he said well why should this have happened to anyone else on the beach and he was right because i asked the question why me as well and i realized that that made me the victim of the scenario and that that kind of an approach wasn't it was understandable and probably necessary for a time, but that that wasn't going to um, lead me to a better place. Yeah. And so I started to change that question and I started asking, well, why not me? Because in doing that, a couple of really important things happened. The first thing that happened was I took responsibility. Um, it was a, a freak accident. It was just an event that happened and so the only thing that would matter was how I responded so I took responsibility and I also decided that I wasn't just going to survive this but that I was going to learn from it I was going to grow from it and I was going to thrive out of it and so I started to that was like some of the most fundamental decision making that led me from a place of desperation to a place where I was like you know this might be some of the lowest places that I've ever been <clears throat> but I can leverage this as an opportunity if I look at it the right way and it's a very brave way of thinking 
yeah, and it wasn't easy all the time. And I'd be lying if I said I made that decision once. Yeah. Because that was a decision to say, to say, yes, I can to keep on fighting. That decision is something that we all make um, in different places and different times of yeah. our lives. And it's something that shows up every day. Like, you have to choose to rise to the challenge that life presents to you each and every day yeah. because it comes in different ways, shapes, and forms um, every single day for all of us. And really, that is that fundamental decision is choosing whether you believe that you're worthy of of making the tough choice. You know, you have to come through a place of, that we all go through at different times of our life of not telling, thinking that we're worthwhile, and all of these kind of feelings, those places of desperation that we find ourselves in at times, and deciding that no I'm worth it and I'm willing to to take the actions repeatedly that are going to going to bring me to a better place yeah try your best at it yeah so um over the course of the next couple of years I think one of the biggest things that really stretched me was in rehab I said well what from here you know and um I was just getting ready to go back into the second year of college when I had the accident so my goal became to go back to college and that was huge um literally going from a place where i was learning to breathe again um to having a goal to be in college again the following start of the next year it's a big jump that was a big jump <laughs> is right and um, during that year i spent seven months in rehab and then i moved home and moving home was probably the hardest thing of all because I was moving back out into the country. I was isolated from my friends. When I moved back out, they were all sitting in college exams. So I didn't see anyone for about six weeks. And um, I, during that summer, was spending a lot of time alone because a lot of my friends had to get on with their own lives. And it was important that they did. Um, and some of them went traveling and different things. And so that summer, I probably slipped to the darkest place that I was in, where it was days on end when I wasn't able to speak to anyone, let, let alone make eye contact with people, because I just didn't want people to see or have any concept of what I was going through. You just didn't want to put on the mask, can you? I, I, I couldn't rise to putting on yeah, the mask. Yeah, you didn't want to fake it, like. And um, so I went through all of that, and... Um, somehow at the end of the summer looked back and I said despite all of the challenge that that was um, we put positive steps in place because I was working all the time through through that to get back to college and 13 months after the injury I found myself back in college and for the first couple of months I was literally just surviving I was living away from home again um, and everybody on the outside thought it was this triumphant story yeah. um, that I was back in college and look, it's, it's, it's a huge achievement. And in many ways it was, but a lot of people didn't recognise the reality that a lot of problems with it, like. I still hadn't got anything figured out, you know. Um, I hadn't got my habits and routines down. I didn't understand how to manage a spinal cord injury very well at that time. And the reality was, is I was living on campus. And to be up and in for nine o'clock, I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning with the assistance of two people just to get up and ready for the day. Yeah, was a friends of yours or? Um, no, so I had um, I had two assistants that would help me and um, it was just nuts. Um, I would be so far outside my comfort zone and so exhausted by lunchtime that I'd just pass out on the table somewhere um, because I was too tired to get back into bed. And that was kind of the story for the first couple of months. Um, when I would go out, I would get absolutely plastered because I was just, just release, yeah. trying to, it was my only way of releasing. And the frustration was building up all the time because I'd lost all my venting mechanisms. Like I couldn't, I couldn't head out into water to go windsurfing. I couldn't go for a run. I couldn't go and play rugby. And yeah, so the frustration, all, all this frustration was building and building. And um, really I, the only way I had of dealing with it was uh, Man, you used to get plastic, you'd get hammer drunk. I'd get hammer drunk and the how other would, how would 
how would you eat home with it? Like, how? I have a lot of understanding friends. <laughs> um, and so, so like, I, I can remember there'd be stages where I would just smash things because that was my only way of getting, like, a little release. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. financially sustainable at all. Like, so um, it's an expensive release. Yeah. So as I came through the first couple of months of college, I was literally just surviving, and um, I made it to Christmas, and I remember sitting at the Christmas table uh, or the dinner table at Christmas, and all of us looked at each other, and like it was a real moment for my family because we'd sort of done it, like we'd done this thing that we said we were going to do a couple of a year and a half previously and I'd gotten back to college and once I appreciated that I stopped being so brutal on myself and um, I I really discovered I call it the other self and it's that part of ourselves that we all have and it's that part of ourselves that we recognize when um, we take on a big challenge in our lives or we're faced with a big challenge in the way that I was and the other self is the part that realizes we're capable of more than we ever thought possible. And we were chatting about this earlier, like someone else might decide to run a marathon and in the process of going through all the steps that it takes to get to that point of actually being able to do the marathon and then completing it or getting halfway or whatever, they don't only realize that physically they're capable of doing amazing things. That it transfers to the other parts. Yeah, they're like. smashing the limits that they they put on themselves. Like yeah, and so I really realised that around Christmas that year, and um, it started getting me thinking in, bigger in all sorts of areas of my life, and around that time as well, I went over to a place called Prime Physio, which was a a training or a physio centre in the UK for people with spinal injuries, and the guy over there, his name is Andy. And he's this like hard nosed ex military guy, uh, from Scotland, and uh, he bloody put me, me through my paces for the week. But that was fantastic because he really understood what I was about. That I was looking for a way to express my body again, to understand my body. Um, and that was like really the the beginnings of me putting back in the pieces of my life together again because. I recognized that Christmas that yes, I had this like massive part of me that had so much potential, but that I'd also become dissociated from the things that were really important in my well being over my whole life before that, which was mind, body, soul, like having a connection to all those things in different ways, and that I'd been removed from all of them. And so uh for me at that stage the first step was to reintegrate with my body. And Andy, I spent a week with Andy over in, in the physio uh, center. And from the beginning of the week, I was doing resistance bands and then weights. And then I was getting back yeah. on the rowing machine. And at the end of the week, I was able to walk in a robotic exoskeleton and give my dad a hug face to face. And like, they're just psychologically massive wins. Um, but that was sort of the week that showed me a way to integrate with my body and understand and uh, my body in its, the new way of operating and actually to to begin that journey of some sort of body acceptance you know and appreciating my body for what i could do rather than beating myself up for what what i what had happened yeah. what had happened and uh, then over the next couple of years that allowed me to to go on and start hand cycling and just to look at things from a place of possibility rather than than a closed-minded approach and and that was the thing then that opened me to looking at my mind and again we can chat more about this but like I, I needed to learn to stimulate my mind again so that was great and back in college I was intellectually stimulated and I was surrounded by friends and people of my own age and yeah uh, got involved in societies and things. Oh, that's a huge thing. Like isolation is it's huge. Like even for me, living out, living out in Mayo, all my friends are gone, everything, and it's just it, it plays a massive part in your life. Um, just having people around to just to chat to and have the crack with, and it's actually you know sometimes you just need to get out of your own head and and talk to other people and. And it's I, it's 
un- until it's gone, you don't really realize how important that is. Yeah. Um, and so, like, integrating with that was so important. But then I also really needed to learn how to quieten my mind a bit as well. Mm. Um, and to deal with all this emotion and the stories in my head. And so I started journaling, just asking myself questions and writing about them. Like, um, I think you've done a bit of journaling as well. Yeah, yeah, that was a big thing for um, just to challenge your thoughts and yeah, especially the negative ones. Get them down on paper and just challenge them and see. You know, is this is there any reality to this thought? Is there is there any realness to it? Like, or is it just something? Is this just this negative story that I'm telling myself? Like, yeah, and um, for me as well, it was huge for self awareness because I just I asked myself simple questions like, like how was my day and it's like okay it was a good or a bad day or whatever and I'd say well why was it that way who did I spend time with or what yeah. was it about the person that I enjoyed or didn't enjoy or what were the events or the activities that I was doing today that made me feel good or bad about myself yeah learning, why was that learning so? your triggers and stuff and yeah and it's like it's great it's you have all the answers that you need inside yourself you just need to peel back a few layers and that's a great way to do it um and so i started with that and then i started doing a bit of um, meditation and lately i've uh, been doing some breath work i really like that yeah um and so they were ways to quiet my mind and um then the last piece of the puzzle for me was to connect with uh, my soul again in some way and uh, I'm, I'm not a very religious guy uh, i am spiritual i suppose but um for me my big way of connecting with something bigger than me was to uh to get out traveling again and that was something that seemed very far away for a long time yeah um, but it over the last few years it's very much become a reality for me and uh traveling with friends traveling with family and just going exploring something bigger than me was really nice yeah um, and being part of something bigger than me and it was the same when we did the documentary like that was finding or was it finding boundaries or uh, breaking, breaking boundaries. boundaries um uh that was like a mixture of of going exploring the world but doing it with a group of people that i really cared about and the trials and tribulations that go with that yeah and as well as that then wanting to share the story with, with a bigger audience than ourselves to um, really show this concept that our limitations are only perceived. Yeah. So um, over time, I started to piece back together all these pieces and you realise that it does take time, but... It's a hard thing to do. Looking into yourself is a... Mm. It's so easy just to go with the flow and kind of... Well, personally, for me, it was so easy just to go with the flow and without actually looking at yourself and saying, well, you know, what makes me happy, what makes, what, what puts me to bad moods and all that. It's a hard thing to figure out sometimes. Yeah, and I don't know, you, you spent time in, in New York, I think, getting outside your comfort zone, like that. Crazy place. Yeah, it, uh, it probably triggers a lot for you as well, and you come back and process. Yeah. A big time, we're getting out there, getting somewhere new and just living on your own and have to go find a job somewhere and and getting into different work environments and stuff like that is, it is, it's, yeah, it definitely has, it's hard to see the benefits at the time, but I'm sure looking back now and looking back, you'll, you'll be able to see it. Like. Yeah, and definitely going through college, you know, it was three times when I nearly dropped out. And I'm so happy I didn't. Yeah. Um as challenging as I found the course and 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 just personally being going through personal challenges at different times and coming to terms with myself and all of that kind of thing over the years. I'm so happy that I didn't because it really was a good place for me to be. It was a good framework when I look back to be surrounded by people um and and to have support services of college around me as well. Yeah. Um, for example, the disability service were fantastic. And um, at times I interacted with the counselling service as well. And um, I started getting panic attacks at a certain point and 
and they were fantastic. I was I was lucky as well that I was proactive in going to them, so they didn't really manifest. Yeah. And cause me. You got on top of too it much before. trouble, but but having access to services like that at such a formative period of your life is yeah is really really great and um, and so I'm happy that I did stick it out and um, because it's only looking back that you, you you can like Steve Jobs said it's like looking back it's easy to connect the dots yeah on the things that were important and um, so yeah it's been an interesting couple of years. Yeah, it is not. It's, it's crazy that you went through something, something so life changing, and instead of having the negative mindset of it, of you know why me and oh everything's everything's changed now, to have the mindset to to just look positively at it. Yeah, and look, it's something that we can all adopt over time, though, because. Yeah. This idea that positive thinking solves everything in a heartbeat is is just wrong. I mean, you do Thanks. have to you do have to reckon with the the challenges. Um, mm. But I, I would call myself an optimistic realist because I I don't entirely buy into optimism all the time. I think it's important to look at life and the scenarios and events that we find ourselves in and recognize them for what they are. Okay, this is a challenging situation. It maybe isn't quite what I would, excuse me, maybe it isn't quite what I had imagined would happen or or maybe it's just a shit situation that you find yourself in it in different ways and recognising that is the first step. But then you have a choice. Then you choose how do you respond or how do you choose to view this scenario and um, you can choose an optimistic or a pessimistic response to that. And um, when you recognise that the events that happen are just events. You, the only meaning that is attached to them is the meaning you give them. Yeah. It creates a little bit of space for you and fluidity for you to be, to be a, a bit more in control of how you respond. It's how you react to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, that sort of realization has been really profound for me over the last few years because um it, it gives a little bit of control back where you maybe, um sense that you don't have control. And then over time, you can really build that in. And now, um, when, when I'm faced with different scenarios, it's actually in my head. It, it almost goes off yeah. like a light bulb. I'm like, okay, how am I going to respond here? Yeah, um, yeah. And I actually have that little mental cue now to say, time out. That's the passion of the thinking. No, you know? it's not. But it develops over time. It's yeah. like any habit. Um, if you actively practice it for long enough, it becomes second nature. Um, Something that I I always struggle with is that little negative voice in your head, and for times for me it became kind of overwhelming to the point where it's the only little voice I had. Had you like, how did you deal with that? Yeah, um, it's ever present for everyone. Yeah, um, we all have a different. It's uh, it's actually like physiologically built in. It's. The amygdala or that little chimp in your mind that's talking to you all the time and um, the first ways that I I really learned to deal with it was through journaling and um, and really starting to question like what are my what are my beliefs and what are my values and I would write them down and and then I would say okay and um, are the thoughts that I'm having supporting my beliefs and values and Quite often it was no. Uh, there was like this, as you said, like this negative, negative thought patterns, and um, and so I started to recognize some of the triggers for those, and um, at various times I used like mantras and, and things like this in the morning, and I would I would say certain things about my beliefs uh, to program them in at the start of the day, and then yeah. by lunchtime it's all gone out of your head, and you're like, fuck's sake, this is whatever you're back to your old way of thinking yeah it's, it's, um, it's one of the things you have to keep keep going with it like. yeah and but over time um i started to challenge my thoughts and and it's important to challenge your thoughts because your thoughts lead to the the actions you'll take and they lead to what, yeah, you, what you believe in and all like. of that it's all connected and um and so i started to challenge those thoughts and then i heard this 
quote, and I'm not entirely sure who it's from, but um, the quote was, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. And I really liked that because the way I visualize it is that I have this little monkey in my mind and it's like, it's like having a dog. It's your responsibility to make sure that the dog isn't acting up and to out in public or whatever and even yeah. in private. That's not shitting on the floor, like, and uh, it's your responsibility to to make sure that the dog is behaving appropriately and um, to ma- to manage it. Take ownership of your thoughts. And, and, and the same sort of scenario was true for the way I started thinking about things. That it was it was my responsibility to start to learn to manage my thoughts and to recognize when I was in a negative spiral and to question why that was and to build back in constructive thoughts and beliefs um and it's like i said it's a process it doesn't happen overnight yeah um, but over time it does happen and it can happen and um and yes you'll slip back every now and then but i think like the ultimate form of evolution is the fact that we have this capacity to take responsibility and to take ownership of our own lives and our own thought processes and and of all of these things and um seeking help yeah when you need it to do to do that like you can't always do it by yourself and there was times when i i needed help and i would have no qualms about saying that even not even the like the chat we had before this talking through it some of the stuff that comes up you're like oh that's things make sense you know when someone else says it to you and you're like oh, that, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense like yeah um, just about psychology and why different things you know yeah and having sounding boards like some people going to their friends or talking to a family member or, or a relative or whatever is is plenty to, yeah. to rationalize things sometimes you might need a counselor or a psychotherapist or a psychologist and 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 that's the exact same thing. Like you go to a physio if you hurt your leg. Yeah. You know, if you're having trouble with, with whatever. Um, why would you not be good enough to yourself to go and, and sort out your mind? Yeah, sometimes the head needs to be fixed as well, you know. And and the head leads everything else ultimately. If you're if you're not uh, if you're not well and, and and managing your mind well, we all need a bit of external help every now and then. If you have a cough you're gonna go to the to, to get checked up why would you not have a regular check-in yeah in your mind and one of the things that i started doing um was there was a period when i was i was going for counseling and around the time that that i was getting a bit of an anxiety and i just decided right i'm on straight and narrow now uh, after a little while i'm going to proactively check in and so i for quite a while after that i would every couple of months go and just have a have a session chat and it it's like a totally neutral person who doesn't know you they don't have an opinion and it's their job just to be a standing board they're professional like yeah and you just need that sometimes yeah so valuable like yeah Um, and uh, you don't only need to do it like when when uh, you're in a spot of bother it's like in the same way that they you talk about physical fitness, mental fitness is the same thing. And journaling and meditation and mindfulness or going for a chat with a professional, even when you're well, is that's mind management, you know. So you're working out, your mental working out. Yeah, there you go. Um so you're you're a motivational speaker now and you do talks and stuff. Yeah, so we do various things and um, that's one of the things I do. Um and I also uh, qualified as a pharmacist there a couple of months back. So I finished out the degree and, and I got there. Um, got the piece so of paper. Got the piece of paper and I'm delighted I did. Um, and that was an interesting journey. But yeah, I really believe that there's there's a an onus on, on me nearly. Uh, I've had these realizations over the last couple of years and I've it's led me to read into a huge amount of different areas. And when I go and speak on share some of these messages and some other messages people come up afterwards and we were chatting about this earlier and they're saying where do you learn about these kind of things yeah. and 
unless you find yourself in a situation where you need to go and find these answers you're not gonna you're not gonna need to learn them no and and i think i found myself in a fortunate place that that i uh i was able to find the answers but not everyone does yeah um so i nearly feel a sort of sense of responsibility to to go and share a little bit of what i learned and, and hence the speaking and i, I love it I, I really enjoy that uh, the feedback is is really nice and you've, when someone comes up to you afterwards and and uh oh you for sure you're definitely see the impact you know you're definitely changing lives for sure which is nice the um, information the information you're putting out there and stuff is definitely stuff that that can change lives yeah so that's exciting you know yeah exactly. um, and it's it's like what you're doing with smirk you know it's it's the exact same thing in a different guys it's like you're trying to start a conversation or change a conversation yeah and I like that as well it's just tell what we've learned as well exactly and you know human story is a powerful thing yeah it's I think it's totally underestimated um, in in an age of highlight reels um, and clickbait genuine human story is so powerful um, and people getting on forums like this and sharing a little bit of their, their story or or doing so online like you have like that sense of vulnerability that that is needed to go and do something like that is something that we need more of um, mm. we were chatting earlier about kids and uh, how like the characteristics that children have are some of the best leadership characteristics of anyone like they're curious they're they're resilient and they're really uh, persistent and they're more emotionally connected than any adult out there. They laugh yeah. when they're happy and they cry when they're sad. And, and as adults, we go around trying to be brave enough to remove the mask for a little while. Pretending that everything's all good, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think that, like, people sharing human stories and, and vulnerability, but it's the key to unlocking the ability for others to do that because... When you create a space for someone else to do it, it becomes easier for them to do it and then they can do that for someone else. And, and uh, we can start changing the conversation around yeah. about from, from a place of, of, of mental mental health only being about the negative side of mental health yeah. to it being about, well, How you know, there's an entire spectrum of mental fitness and being yeah. well. And, how to look after yourself. Yeah. The hard thing to learn is how to how to, to look after yourself and there definitely is little things you can implement to, to get that pattern of positive thinking in and stuff yeah absolutely any uh, big goals for 2019 2019 um, I have a few physical ones and um, so I want to go and cycle all of the greenways in Ireland um, end to end so that's that's um, a big one how far is that um, I'm not sure in distance though a lot of them are between 40 and 80 kilometres so um, that's a physical goal of mine and um, then I'm starting uh, a new job uh, next week actually and um, so I'm really excited about that um, it's gonna be a really interesting year uh, working in healthcare innovation and um, we'll be hopefully working on some projects actually uh, to do with mental health and um, very good on physical well-being as well so that's very exciting and then I will be speaking some more. So in terms of um, trying to have an impact, that's that's where my goals uh, for speaking orient, and that involves like schools and seminars and and going into companies and things like that. So that really excites me. But to be honest, most of my goals for the year are around daily habits. Um, like it's very easy to throw out a big goal and it sounds really impressive and um, and that's great but my major goals are around daily habits um, so I understand after the last couple of years of for myself what are the things that make me feel good yeah. on a consistent basis and maybe I've had to pay attention to them more than some others might earlier because like what i do physically every day has a big impact on me and um 
and what I do um, in terms of just taking care of myself really impacts on me and, and I notice much more when I'm out of the kilter now so like making sure that I get eight to nine hours of sleep is key and that doesn't happen unless I wind down the right way in the evening and yeah. remove blue light and um, remove blue light and try and stay off social media for a little while before bed and things like that and I do a lot of stretching in the evening when I get into bed and to calm my body down again and then in the mornings and um, making sure that I get exercise before I leave the house uh, even if it's only 15 20 30 minutes like that's really important to me because it sets my head straight for the day yeah um, and makes my body feel good um, and then I have like weekly habits like so once or twice a week um, I will do gratitude list and I, f- I used to okay. try and do it daily but it just felt disingenuous doing it daily it was forced yeah yeah but when I do it maybe once or twice a week it feels it feels really genuine and um, um, so good, that's a big one yeah it's a good thing to, to look at like yeah uh, the attitude of gratitude it's like when you when you're coming from a place of what you have rather than what you don't have it's an abundance mindset and it's it's a really powerful thing to cultivate and um, so that's another daily habit uh, a huge one for me is uh, fluids so like drinking a ton of water so I said to you earlier I probably drink about three liters of water most days Jeez, good going. and uh, geez, the doctor be happy with me um, but like huge because if you're if you think about your body um your body's made up of hundreds and millions and billions of cells and if you imagine your cells being like little sieves and the more water you pour through the sieve the clearer it's going to be um and the more cleaned out it's going to be and the better it'll operate um and that's the way i think about my body the the more fluid i put into it and keeps everything flushed out keeps my my head clear keeps my body operating well so that's another big habit for me um and these are these are all small things like um on a weekly basis i sit down and before i start my week and i schedule almost everything to the best of it of my ability for the week and that does a couple of things first of all it gives my mind like a, a plan for the week um, and you have this part of your mind called the reticular activating system and um, when it knows what it needs to focus on it sparks much better it's like okay. when you think about for example if you buy a red car all of a sudden you will start seeing everybody has a red car that's this, i never the car i'm driving now right i never seen one on the road before i started driving and then i was like geez these are everywhere <laughs> there you go and um, like that's that's just your mind and um, when it knows what to put attention on that's where your attention goes okay. and so um i i aim to fill my my week with constructive things and um, that will put my attention on on, on proactive and yeah. constructive and helpful things um but it also uh really clears things up for me because it removes all the choices i need to make during the week or things I need to remember. So I can literally flick open my calendar and I'm like, I know where I need to be. I know roughly what I need to do and I'll build in downtime into it and I'll build in spending time, spending time with family or, or friends and I'll schedule that stuff so that it actually does happen. Mom, I can't talk to you now, but <laughs> you're pencil in at four o'clock. <laughs> no, but like, yeah, with obviously it's not like four, four or five, time to go. Good luck. Um, but, uh, but actually, doing that is really useful because um it makes you consider how you're spending your time and if you're spending your time with people that you want to be spending it with and doing things that you want to be spending your time doing and all of those kind of things and these are just habits that i've developed that have really like helped to improve my well-being overall Um, and yeah yeah, it's very important to get all the Get the daily stuff done. Yeah. And if you get the daily basics right, the big stuff takes care of itself, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I hope 2019 is a big year for you. Thank you.
and um, thanks for likes. Well, thanks for inviting me up yeah i'm delighted you're up nice chat again it's very cool seeing um someone that had something so i suppose negative happened to them um and to turn around in such positive light and and, and run with it yeah and i also have to commend you on what you're doing it's it's uh it's brave to venture out into the world and do something uh do something to have a big impact on other people so fair play to you. well look it's given me it's given me the opportunity to sit down with with people like yourself so it's it's pretty good Gladly. thanks for chatting to me no worries anytime